Did you ever hear about Polybius? It was a Nurbil legend that used to travel the World Wide Web back when it wasn't all that worldwide and consisted almost entirely of discussion boards. Basically, the idea was that this strange arcade machine, Polybius, started showing up in arcades. Kids checked it out, its vector graphics and quiz sections were kind of an odd mix, and eventually anyone who played it for any length of time started suffering side effects. An inability to be sad. That one sticks in my merry merry the most. I'm not sure it's just an urban legend. When I used to live in New York in the 1980s, my mom and I would make routine trips to the South Hill Mall in Dutchess County. While she went shopping, I'd get dropped off at the Art Dream Machine Arcade. It was everything you'd imagine. Loud music mingling with chimes and electronic gunfire from a hundred noisy ob obnoxious arcade cabinets all begging for your attention and your money. I was always more of a skee-ball kid. Well, I mean, I'd played video games. I had a Nintendo. Still, something about rolling a ball for the promised reward of that boombox. 10,000 tickets. Or radio-controlled car. 25,000 tickets. Always pulled me to that roar of miniature bowling alleys. I wasn't really good at it. Though I rarely rolled zeros. The last time I went to a dream machine, a friend of mine from school I had come along for the trip, Nicholas. He and I shared a lot of common interests, though we didn't realize every kid our age did. Popular cartoon, toys, and yes, games. We'd met when I first came to that school. He greeted me on the playground with a hearty pat on the back and a, How you doing? Soon after, I found out he had a bunch of wild berries from the school grounds in his hand. My parents made his parents pay for the shirt after the stain wouldn't come out. It had been brand new, you know, so I'd make a good impression and all. So yeah, Nicholas was kind of a dick. I don't even know how we became friends, but eventually it happened. As we went into the arcade together, he turned to me and held out his hand. What? I studied his open palm. Quarters. Your mom said we were supposed to share. She had given me a handful in the car, but I hadn't heard her say that. Still, I figured he wouldn't lie about something like that, so I handed over half. With that, he was gone, into, a, into the crowd of strange kids I didn't know. As you already figured, we weren't supposed to share. Looking back, I figured his parents thought that if they had to pay for my shirt, why should he have to pay game, for games when we were the ones taking him out? Seems like a hell of a thing to tell your kid to lie if you wanted any coins, but hey. Playing a game was 25 cents, if you can believe it. Theoretically, if you had some serious mojo, you can be an entire game or rack up skee ball tickets for a single coin. 50 cent games were really the fantastic ones, but I ignored them out of principle. So I rolled and collected tickets, game after game. When I was almost finished sooner than I should, since I was down half my gaming allowance, these other two kids approached. Yo, can I get a roll? The larger of the two kids asked. He was still smaller than me, but he was at least a head taller than the other kid who was following me. I didn't want to say yes, but I did. Sure. He rolled one ball up the track. My brother too. The bigger little kid gestured to the smaller little kid. It was a way of saying, hey, it's only fair to include him. Okay. The kid rolls too. One more. The bigger little kid doesn't even wait for me to agree before he rolls another. His little brother doesn't even ask before he does the same. And that was it. I had no more rolls and no more quarters. I went to collect a string of tickets, but the big brother beat me to it. Hey, I rolled some of these, but it was my quarter. He pulled off a couple tickets and they both disappeared into the crowd, dropping the rest on the floor for me to scoop up. Needless to say, I was getting very angry. Very sad. There is nothing quite like being alone in a crowd, you know. I tried to find Nicholas, but had no luck. Either he was walking around the arcade too and I kept missing him, or he just left the arcade and went to buy ice cream with the quarters I shared with him. I don't even know, know how I managed to even hear it over the din. Please press start. Please press start. It was a loop of the same sing-song phrase, uttered by some deep mechanical voice that sounded like Darth Vader's or Worf or some sort of sci-fi tough guy. I found the source of the voice and saw it belong to a jet black arcade cabinet in the back corner of the place, right by a door that read, Office. The sides of the cabinet, or at least the one I could see since it wasn't against the wall, displayed a typical overdone airbrush-like painting. It was a kid like me, but dressed in some sort of youth scout office, outfit. His clothes were torn, and he had a look of resolve on his face. He, had a he held a crossbow as strange alien skeletons swarmed from tombstones behind him. The name above the machine's blinding strobing screen read, Skull and Crossbow. 
I focused on the screen. It was black, like the cabinet, except for the source of the blur brilliant flashes. It was the same phrase the machine kept spouting, its heavy bass pulsing through me in waves. Please press start. Please press start. Please press start. I watched it for a few seconds, then looked around. Somewhere, someone somewhere had put a quarter in and left. Or they had gotten a free game and didn't know it. This wasn't the first time I'd seen this happen, and I always dreaded it would happen to me, that I'd missed a free game I had earned. Nobody was around. The voice from the machine, seemingly frustrated, became more insistent as if time was running out. Please press start. Please press start. Please press start. I lined myself up in front of the controls with a simple joystick and a couple red buttons, and I pressed start. Instantly, a uh, elongated pointy-headed skull filled the screen, its hollow eyes staring directly at my face. It was the briefest moment, and my mind barely registered it, but it was there. The game shook me with another heavy bass exclamation as the screen went completely black as quickly as the skull had appeared. Fool. I thought about stopping right there. There was no short supply of gory monster themed games in the arcade, and I'd never chosen to play any of them. I had seen one called Chiller that made you shoot people and objects just to torture them. It was filled with blood and violence and torture. I had nightmares about it on and off for weeks after I'd seen it, and I was only watching someone else play. I couldn't leave because I was surrounded by a half circle of other kids who were laughing and cheering in every vomit inducing scene. In the end, however, the need to make sure the game wasn't wasted overruled my fears about its content. First phase. The words I saw on the screen seemed odd. The only time I heard phase was on Star Trek. You know, phaser? Whatever that mean. Before I could think about it too much, I was under attack. On screen, that is. My character, the aforementioned youth scout, was at the bottom of the screen. At the top, the sprite of an elongated pointy skull followed, the, followed by a series of rib cages. The first ribcage had skeletal arms, and at the end of this bone monstrosity was a pelvis with skeletal legs. Relief washed over me. It was a sequel to, or clone, of Centipede, and I'd played that hundred of times on my cousin's old Atari. He'd given it to me as soon as he, he noticed girls. The setting was a graveyard. Tombstones blocked my arrows, but would crumble with each hit. There were also several open graves that didn't seem to do anything. They certainly didn't stop or slow this crazy skeleton that was turning and hurrying downwards. Each arrow fired gave a satisfying thrum of the bowstring and made a nice crack when it hit a stone. However, when the big skeleton was hit, it would make this awful screech. The sound was distorted by the speakers or something. It was amped up too loud and had too high of a pitch to be smoothly projected. It sounded like a cassette tape being eaten by the player. This drawn out and shrill noise. I fired arrows willy-nilly, just getting a feel for the controls and such. Since it seemed to be the first level, or at least an early one, I dispatched the skeletal thing with a relative ease. The screen went black again, with these words in white. Oad is fighting mad now. Oad? Must be the skeleton thing. Oad like Toad or Odor. Seemed fitting. Second phase. I was very ready for it to increase in difficulty. This was only to be expected. As I thought, Oad moved faster now, whipping his head around and falling with his snake-like body in rapid order. Every time I blew off his head, it would just move back and replace one of the rib cages. If I blew off any other part of him, he'd grow shorter at the end. So it seemed like targeting his head was a good idea, because it essentially set him back a bit while shorting his rear end did a little good. I fired rapidly, took out his head when I could, and the rest of him when I didn't have that prime opportunity. Then Oad did something weird. He stopped. Just froze and let me pick off his ribs. He opened his jaws and coughed up the bone with one sharpened end pointed right at my character. It descended so quickly that I could barely move out of the way in time. The worst part was that the bone spear was belched forth with the most disturbing sound yet. This puke-like hua that made me feel sick to, sick to my stomach. The heavy bass of the game didn't help, thrusting the gross audio straight into the core of my body. It was a bit harder to beat this level, as you'd assume with any phase 2. Still, I was triumphant in spite of how close Oad had come to the bottom of the screen, which surely meant a loss. The screen went black. Watch your step. Third phase. The game started again, and nothing seemed different. Oad didn't move any faster, and while he still barfed the occasional spear, it wasn't shaping up to be very difficult. I'd say I had about half of his twisted grim little body gone before anything changed. 
Then, out of the open graves, little skeletons crawled out periodically and continued to crawl through the graveyard, all the way to the bottom in a straight line. I specifically remember that the skeletons were generally the same size, but had small variations in height and the light. Some had little bits of rotten clothes, while others were missing limbs or even heads. No two were alike, which seemed very ambitious for an arcade at the time when it was common to battle hundreds of, hundreds of identical thugs. Between watching OAD and keeping track of the crawlers and avoiding the damn bone spears OAD had endlessly spewed at me, I was overwhelmed. One of the crawlers touched me and touched the sprite, I mean, and I was dead. He was dead. My heart sank, but it always did whenever I lost a game like this. There was nothing to get that upset about, but you know that feels. Life 2 or 3. The screen drew me back in again, informing me that I had only lost one of three lives that the quarter had paid for. I don't know why it had slipped my mind, but that game really ended after one try. But I'd completely bought into the idea that if I died, if the character died, that was it. Death was final, and that's how I had been thinking. I barely got my hands back on the control before the round started again. This time, I focused on killing the crawlers the second their little heads poked out of the soil. Destroying Oa's body took a backseat the second I saw the, a crawler staring. Fire, 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 fire. Crawler, take it out. Fire, 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 fire. I was getting into the groove of it now, and all I heard was the sound of the machine. The music that filled the place, all the clicks and hoots of other games, that was all gone. And I, all I remember hearing was the strange off-kilter off music of Skull and Crossbone. Every thrum, every thwack, every shriek of the villain filled my ears. I wanted to hear his speaker rattling death scream forever. Die, oh, I die, and die, and die, and die. Keep dying. I hate you. I want to beat your game. I want you to cry about it because you're disgusting. I don't like you either. My heart raced. My jaw dropped. I beat in the level, and that was the next message to greet me. In a childlike way, I reasoned that I couldn't have been... It couldn't have been specifically saying that to me, because I'd only thought how much I hated Oad. I hadn't said anything, so it cr clearly couldn't have hurt me. Final Faith. This was it. The final level. It seemed odd that the game was so short, but there you are. Nicholas called out to me as if I had been hiding instead of searching the whole place for him. He was carrying a, a shopping bag from the comic store. Not now, I snapped. What are you playing? Skull and Crossbow. He said the game's name as if it were an insult. The same way a kid would say, you play Barbies? Shh. What? Is it good? Stop it. I'm on the last level. Be quiet. Nicholas came up to me, stared into the screen, and started pushing me out of the way. Hey, hey! I screamed as loud as I could. Come on, give me a turn. No! I mustered everything within me and boomed out the most threatening sound I could manage. No! Nicholas stepped away. Fine, baby. I didn't reply. I was busy killing Oad and his family. Baby, he repeated. Fine, baby. He wasn't getting a response from me. Not now, not when I was so close to winning the game. I had never actually been in an arcade game before, and never would after. Next thing I knew, I was on the ground. Nicholas had shoved me, and I didn't even know what was happening until I was on the rock-hard red carpet. Old Sutta and Grimes stuck to my arms as I laid sideways on the floor. I, my character, died again. Well, without me there to guide the little scout and tell him where to fire, he just stood there frozen. Oh, I'd slithered down, bones rattling, claws clack clacking. The game made an awful sound, the perfect likeness of a little boy screaming as he was slowly eating alive. The tearing of flesh, the spurting of blood, the gurgle from the boy's throat after he couldn't scream anymore, it was all there. Cool! Nicholas took my place at the controls as I rolled over and got to me, got to my feet. Stop it right now! I screamed. Drop dead! Nicholas replied coolly, it's my turn now. I tried to push him away from the game, shove him like he'd done to me, but I was weak. My hands were shaking, my head and eyes were so hot, and I could barely stand much less force an able-bodied kid out of that space. Nicholas jerked the controls, mashed the buttons harm hard with his palm. He didn't even know how to play at all, he wasn't in the swing of it, and he was starting on the hardest level. Die, 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 he chanted excitedly. This is cool. I'm playing it out. You can get next. I don't have any quarters, I whined, now basically crumpled in a heap and grasping at his knees so I, as if I could pull it from under him. Oh, darn. He kept playing eyes on the screen. I started to build up my strength to attempt one final lunge at my former friend. But before I could get to that point, that sound was projected from the cabinet once again. 
a screaming eating a gurgle of air bubbling through blood. Game over. Ha 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 ha. The game sounded pretty happy about it. Oh well. That was too hard. This game sucks. Nicholas didn't get it. Oh, I needed to die and I was just about to kill him. He walked around the arcade cabinet and peered into the half inch of space between the back of the machine and the wall. Then he tried to move it. What are you doing? I was on my feet again, barely. And the last thing I wanted at this point was for this idiot to get us in trouble. If you unplug these... Nicholas tried to squeeze his hand behind the machine, but it wouldn't fit. They give you a free game sometimes. I was on board. Anything to finish what I started. Was that a second thought? I was beside Nicholas, trying to pull the cabinet away from the wall just enough to find the plug and remove it. The two of us jostled and rocked the heavy machine until we slid it away from the wall a couple of feet. Nicholas looked behind the machine again and froze. What? I was getting frustrated. I wanted another free game. Help! Nicholas stammered. I stormed over close to him and looked over his shoulder. The arcade cabinet, the skull and crossbone games, it had no back. It was just an open space into infinite darkness. There at the threshold of this impossible void was the elongated skull, the ribcage, the skeletal arms and taloned hands. Here live Oad. Behind him an endless string of ribs and vertebrae led into a spiral into absolute darkness. It seized Nicholas in its hands. He let out a soft cry, a whimper, and it retracted into the darkness with him. The cabinet of its own volition slammed back against the wall like a door caught by the wind. Slowly, unthinking, I backed away. After a moment of complete silence, the echoing din of the arcade returned to me. I could hear it all, the music, the games, the other kids, and I heard Skull and Crossbone once again singing its song. Please set press start. Please press start. Please press start. Please press start. When I stopped staring at the back of the machine because my eyes burned and not due to any regaining of sense, I turned my gaze to the screen, where Oad rested at the top of the empty graveyard. I swear. I swear he had an extra set of ribs. Since the day it happened, I had imagined killing him a thousand times. Sometimes I would punch and kick him until he cried and begged for mercy. Other times I'd blow him up or shoot him or do any number of things I've seen in Robocop or Terminator. Still, I was only a child and nowhere near capable of killing someone, much less doing it with an improvised explosive device made on made of household cleaners and 9 volt batteries as I'd imagined it. Oad. That was the name given to my nightmares by the friendly men and women of Playco Inc., makers of fine games such as Urchin 300 and Vague Assault. Plus, of course, Skull and Crossbow, a game I'd forget, forever regret playing. I'd found it at the mall one day, and it seemed as if someone had put in a quarter and left. I took up the free game, and it got into my head. When everything was said and done, someone, some thing, reached out of the game cabinet and took my friend away. The only reason I'd been spared that fate was because he because he had tried to horn in on what I was doing, took the controls from me. Nicholas. Less than a year later, I was having trouble remembering his name. I would have chalked it up to my imagination, or a dream, or anything that would let me believe it hadn't happened. But, Nicholas. His parents searched for him. The police searched for him. His disappearance kicked off a huge scandal for the mall and the arcade. Before long, the Dream Machine Arcade was closed due to unrelated circumstances, and I lost my only shot at figuring out what really happened. It didn't help that I lied. I didn't lie because nobody would believe in Oad, the many ripped skeleton centipede from Netherworld. Though they wouldn't, no. I lied because I couldn't bring myself to admit I had had any part whatsoever in the disappearance, the death, of Nicholas. His parents cornered me one day when I was leaving school and making my way down to the bus. They backed me to one of the brick, red brick walls and frantic, demanded to know what had happened to their son because I must know something I'm not saying. I must have looked absolutely horrified, which I was, because one of the bus drivers actually left her vehicle and ran over to see what was going on. 
that took that driver and two other teachers to escort the couple away. Every step, they kept shouting at me, screaming that they knew I saw who'd taken their boy. They were right. However, what disturbed me more than anything else was how I felt all about it all. I dreaded being discovered. I was frightened that Oad would find me somehow, maybe slip out from under my bed. And I was enraged by my now hazy memories to the point of repeated mental butchering of that skeletal freak. Yet, I was never sad about it. I never shed a tear for Nicholas. I hadn't cried once. When my hamster got lost and we never found it, when Grandma passed away, when my parents fought and threatened to split up, I didn't feel sad about anything anymore. After a while, Oed was replaced by other faces within my imaginary torture chamber. Anyone who annoyed or threatened me in any way, sometimes it was even Nicholas himself who had caused the entire problem in the first place. <sighs> by now, I'm wondering if you're, you've considered the fact that I openly me mentioned Playco, makers of the accursed, maybe cur just cursed, game that had so afflicted my young life. Thank you for purchasing for the Playco 280 game mega console. Plug in this state of the art gaming device directly into your television. For you it is to enjoy countless hours of fun. 280 games, 280 new adventure. Game included on this a console. 21 horse fun run rally. Age of battle. Art control. Beach calm. Fear command. Glee glee. Gorilla. Urchin 300, Vague Assault, Xenofo 84, and plenty more. I read the back of the box while my mom was elsewhere in the drugstore. Both of my parents had kept a close eye on me ever since Nicholas was kidnapped, but every once in a while I could slip away from my guards. When she did catch up with me, I was studying the box art. It showed tons of different animal characters, animals, and creatures all surrounding this odd green hex hexagonal gaming console with a glowing white fish icon on its surface. Oh no, she remarked the instant that she saw it. I know, I replied. I'm just looking. To be honest, I wasn't really that into video games in light of what had occurred. I hadn't played any, hadn't thought about them, and didn't really care to. Still, something about this object in my hands just felt safe. It was like I had been burned in the past, but was ready to start exploring a new relationships again. Still, I knew I couldn't get it, so I put it back on the shelf and stepped away, still fixated on its glossy cover. You're such a good kid. I didn't know how to reply to that. Mom walked over to the shelf and looked at the box. As an adult, her I immediately moved to the red price sticker I'd paid absolutely no attention. Well, she thought for a moment. Then without another word, she picked up the box and carefully placed it in the shopping cart. Really? I nearly gasped. Yeah, we can call it an early birthday present. I knew full well by this point that early birthday presents didn't really detract from the shower of toys that would rain up down upon me on the actual date. When I got home, she'd regret the purchase. I couldn't be calm to buy anything short of setting up the console as quickly as possible. The direction seemed confusing written in broken English and referencing specific cables and cords by technical names instead of uh, the large plug or the screwy shape thing. She almost had it set up and I was dancing in place when there was a sudden loud pop and a flash of light. She screamed. Are you okay? I rushed over to her, once again on edge. Yeah, yes. She stammered, blinking repeatedly. I got a shock, I'm okay, don't worry about it. I did worry but I had no time that I feel sad about it. Within minutes, the console had been started, and the television screen faded from black to a dark green. A chiming sound played, and the screen read, Play Coat Inc. Dream Real. I selected Glee Glee completely at random and got playing. It was a side-scrolling shooter where I guided some sort of spacecraft through the barrage of other oddly shaped tiny fighters. When the level had started, the game name was written in and bland block lettering, with the instructions just beneath. Guide you ship to home, along the way, press Z button to fire, press X button to shield. I should mention that the controller, just one, as it seemed there was no capability for a two player mode, was just a directional pad, a shared start reset button, and two little dots marked X and Z. 
The controls were clunky at best and, at worst, completely unresponsive. The sound didn't make very good use of the television speakers. Dull, slow buzzes and distorted chirps signaled everything from player damage to the destruction of enemy fighters. I racked up many deaths and plenty of restarts on Gleagly, but for some reason I felt compelled to keep trying. On what must have been my 6th to 8th restart, the controls were feeling a lot more responsive and easy to use. Either I had worn in the factory new controller or the game itself was reducing, reducing the difficulty for me. I zipped back and forth, blowing up enemies and putting up my shield to avoid fire. I shot in rapid succession and picked up a series of power-ups that did nothing more than cause my bullets, a plain pixel, to move in different ways. I was destroying the opposing team, blasting, blasting, blasting away when I took note of something strange. At some point, the enemy fighters, the tiny spaceships, had been swept out for what appeared to be large fetus-like creatures. I stopped firing when I realized that instead of attacking me, instead of firing and dodging, they were just trying to get away from me. At some point, I had stopped defending myself and smoothly transitioned into pe peppering defensive pre-birth beings with deadly fire. I let the game run for a few minutes as I watched this spectacle. A space fetus would drop onto the screen, then slowly float away from my ship. Though they were formed of the most basic pixel imagery, I could swear they looked scared. The change was confusing and disquieting, so I stopped the game and decided to se select another. Urchin 300. Follow an underwater pass. Avoid an urchin. Use your X button to place the bombs. Use your Z button to skip a turn. The screen became a grid of 10x10 10 10 tiles. At the center was a little person and all around him placed randomly were four round spiny urchins. The urchins were easily twice the size of the player sprite and had a single large whirling eyeball on top of their bodies, heads. I moved the little man onto another tile after which all the urchins moved one tile closer to him. I quickly got the idea. Every time I moved, the urchins would try to get a little closer to me. It was reasonable to assume that if any of them touched me, I'd be dead. Rather, the little guy would be dead. I pressed the Z button to place a bomb, figuring I could somehow trick the urchins into it. Unfortunately, I had mixed them up in my head, and the Z button was to skip a turn. The urchins drew closer and I hadn't even moved. Using the correct button, I dropped a bomb, a cartoon spherical bomb with a fuse, uh, and moved on to the next tile. Above me and to the right, two urchins moved on to the same tile, creating a single urchin with two eyes. The eyes didn't rotate anymore, and instead fixed straight forward, out of the screen and onto me. By moving clear, cleverly and placing bombs in the, much the same manner, I eventually guided all the urchins, even the unpleasant two-eyed urchin, to their destruction. Each time one touched a bomb, it would burst in the most pleasing multicolored explosion. It was a dazzling flash that immediately drew my attention and made me want to see it again and again, over and over. I was, uh, I was about three levels in, when I was surrounded by mounting numbers of urchins that I finally slipped up. Seeing no way out of a corner I painted myself into, I quickly tapped the Z button and skipped enough turns for the urchins to close in and end the round. As soon as the first urchin touched the player's spray, a sudden ear-splitting shriek emanated from the speakers. I physically jumped at the unexpected scream and quickly turned down the volume. I watched in impotent anger as the urchin knocked me down, undulated over me and began spinning its eyeball even more wildly than before. It bobbed up and down, all the while making the sound of teeth grinding bone. When it was finished, the urchin moved off the tile, leaving nothing behind but a trail of dark red blood that mirrored the playing field as it slowly made its way across the screen. At this point, I was ready to select another game, and I'd already realized that this system might never, actually never get played with again after today. My thumb was over the start reset button, a split second away from plung plunging down upon it when the screen stopped me cold. Nicholas 2 of 3. The grid reappeared, still smeared with blood. The urchins had ra been randomly placed again, and there was my spray at the center of his screen. What? I whispered, completely focusing on the little man. I put the controller down and crawled on hands and knees to the screen. Nicholas? I didn't even know what I was looking for, or what the game had meant. For all I knew, the main character just happened to have the same the name, like Mario or Samus. The sprite moved. It was a slight, almost unnoticeable movement, 
just a tilt of the head as the little man looked at the closest urchin and then looked away. If I hadn't been two inches from the screen, I doubt I would have seen it. I grabbed the controller and immediately hit start reset to end this horrible game. After that, I turn it off and what, break it? As soon as I ended the game, the urchins all made a unanimous sweeping movement towards the player. Towards Nicholas? Before they reached him as the second ear splitting shriek ripped through me, regardless of the volume setting, the screen faded a dark red. The letters appeared in white, in the same bland game text. Quitter. Poor Nicholas. I ran from the room all the way to the backyard where my mother was working on her herb garden. Mom! What? Is something wrong? Mom! Mom! I ran into her arms, nearly knocking her over. It's Nicholas! Her face immediately turned from concern to shock. What, dear, what? Did, did you remember something? I just held on tight and didn't say a word. My mind raced. Could I say what had really happened? Could I show her the game, make it say Nicholas, and convince her? What about all the blame I'd get for lying all this time? As I searched my thoughts in a matter of seconds, I realized something was missing. Guilt. I didn't, even f I didn't feel guilty anymore. I didn't care about lying or continuing to lie. I didn't feel guilty for what had happened to Nicholas. And I didn't necessarily care if he ever came back. In the absence of this emotion, I couldn't put my finger on why I'd even run to my mom in the first place. It was like I had suddenly been relieved of a heavy burden and no longer had any fear of repercussion. Never mind, I finally replied. Everything is okay. Calmly and in a way I'm sure must have confused my mother, I strolled back into the house, to the console and sat down in front of it. I looked for, through the menu again and decided to play something new. I went directly to the bottom of the list to the very last game and to this day I don't even know what made me sure I wanted to play it. Xenofo 84. Nothing makes sense in the Minus world. A familiar skull face flashed on the screen only briefly, and within moments all I could feel was a blinding sense of rage. Hi Nicholas. I grinned cruelly at the little man on the screen. Now we can play again. And again. And again. How long had I been playing? I I want to say it was only a few hours, but all the evidence was to the contrary. The time of night, the headache, the pain in my eyes from staring at the screen, and not least of all my parents. I was being incredibly quiet. I had turned off the volume, but somehow they sensed someone was in the living room. There I was, eyes glued to the screen, playing weird worms on my 280 game play golden console. My dad actually had to jostle me, shake my shoulder to get my attention. Right up until that moment, I thought I'd been completely alone in the room. I didn't hear him approach, didn't hear him ask what the hell I was doing at 5, 6 AM? And I didn't hear him scolding when I didn't respond. Instead, despite the muted television set, all I heard was the blaring ruckus of the game system, a series of beeps and buzzes that were no longer coming from an external source. My brain lit up with each noise, and everything except the screen was awash in whirling colored kaleidoscopic hues. It was decided that I had a gaming addiction, probably the first diagnosis of this phenomena as well. I had been seeing a child psychologist by force since Nicholas had disappeared. I'd found myself envisioning the kidnapping in my own personal thoughts, just how everybody else insisted it happened. There was a large part of me that wanted to believe that. When faced with the choice between perverted child killer versus inexplicable bone horror, the mind tends to gravitate towards the former. I even told the psychologist about how I had spotted Nicholas in the Playco games, how I could control him, how I watched him die hundreds of times, and how I particularly didn't care. The results? Pills, naturally. Pills as colorful and as plentiful as the dizzying spots and streaks I'd see when playing my games. Oh, and I kept playing them, don't doubt that for a second. The console was taken away, hidden, re-hidden, but I'd always find it eventually. After a couple of screaming matches and full-on spanking, I learned to rehire the thing exactly as I found it when a car pulled into the driveway. 
They could never bring themselves to break my heart by throwing it away or giving it to some other dumb kid though. That was their mistake. They attributed my behavior to the trauma and side effects of the medication based on whichever they tried they had last tried to address. Stealing, lying, basically doing whatever I felt because it was fun. I had no more sadness, no more guilt, and after enough sessions of Quiznap, I could feel my grip on happiness and fear loosening. Anger. I had plenty of anger, great heaping stockpiles of it. Everywhere those emotions had been, anger stepped in to courteously fill the position. I became enraged at the simplest things, even things that I myself had caused and things that were intended to fill me with joy. When Christmas came around and I was expected to open my presents in front of my parents, my cousins, and my aunt, I flipped out. There was nothing wrong, no flaw in the behavior or absence of presents I wanted. I was just pissed at the idea that anything new was occurring. They took away the presents, wrapped in shiny paper and bows and all that, took them away and said I couldn't have them until I apologized. I never apologized, and I didn't need any of that shit because I knew where the console was hidden. My favorite game on the console was definitely Xeno 484. It took place somewhere called the Minus World, and featured a series of questions that affected gameplay in ways I, could, I wouldn't think possible. The basic setup was, print, was simple. At the center of the screen was a tiny ship, not unlike the game Asteroids, and all around was a sea of skull, bones, and so on. Shooting a giant skull would splinter it into three tiny skulls. Shooting one of those would splinter that into little bones. Each smaller object moved faster, spiraling around in this black, featureless abyss. Every so often, the faces would appear. Pixelated, stark white faces that looked remarkably like people I knew or had known. The first time it happened, I was startled to see my mother's emotional visage looping and turning around my little ship. Then it was my dad. Then the child psychologist I had been seeing. Then other kids and relatives. Shooting at them enough gradually peeled off the flesh from their faces, revealing first gristle, then muscle, then bone. If I removed enough of my loved one's flesh, they'd become right regular giant skulls, and, well, you're familiar with that part already. Even though I was clearly guiding a little ship, each new turn was signaled by reminding me how many Nicholases I had left. Nicholas 2 of 3, Nicholas 3 of 3. Additionally, with every on-screen death, the identical death cry that was now slowly taking the properties of his actual voice. Now I'm realizing that I've completely forgotten to mention Oad. He does that sometimes, darts around in my memory, hides behind things. Sometimes I'm reminded of Oad by it simply because I hear the clattering of his bones and wonder what's in my head. I imagine this is what would it, it would be like to have a tapeworm in your brain. But instead of feeding on what you eat, it's siphoning your thoughts and emotions. Oad. Xenofo 84 was in all random schools and not so random faces. Every so often, if I was doing particular, particularly well during a round, Oad himself would come in at some strange angle and ribcage after ribcage following would collide with my ship and end the turn. It seemed like there was no way to avoid him if I moved the ship. No matter how quickly, he would simply alter his route and destroy me anyways. Then the explosion, the scream, and the question or statement between rounds. Most of the text was innocuous enough, do you want to keep playing? And do you think you will win? Some of the, f the more disturbing lines, back when I could feel disturbed, ranged from I hate you to Nicholas hates you and do you know how far you've gone? It was Oad who told me in that white block, block lettering to throw away the pills. He even told me where the console was going to be hitting next when my parents suspected I'd been getting at it. I will be in the attic. But yes, sometimes the questions or statements will change the game in strange ways. It once asked, what would you kill someone with? To which I answered, spoke, the word knife. In the next round, whirling machete-like blades had replaced the standard pixel-sized bullets my ship had fired. Using this method, I'd received power-ups like flamethrowers, bazookas, and even an ill-conceived request for a bigger ship. All that did was make the ship on screen easier to hit, and I could see Nicholas in the cockpit, 
clawing at the hatch desperately, his face, only a few pixels in width, frozen in a black-eyed scream. I was getting better at the game. As days, weeks, and months passed, all I, could, all I thought about was how to beat the game. How to progress to the next level, defeat any new threats, and what power-ups I could ask for that would benefit me, benefit me the most. At the very end, I had come to the realization that the play Komodo, the one that greeted me every time I powered up the console, actually did quite well ex to explain what was happening. Playco Inc. Dream Real. Dream it, and it's real. The last time I played Xeno, the last time I played with the console at all, I came prepared and was ready to quest the power-up that would help me win the, the game. It knew. I don't know how. Don't know how it did anything, really, but it knew. Before the first round started, the screen stayed blank for the longest time, and blood-red block letters faded onto the screen. Say it. I could barely get another breath to talk. I knew that this was going to be the night, that icy silent night, right around the stroke of midnight, that was going to be the night I finally defeated Oad. I thought of... the thought of outwitting him had thrilled me. The thought that he might whine or gasp or give some sort of sign of weakness was all I lived for in that moment. It had been a long time coming and I was finally going to see what happened when I had the upper hand over this mysterious otherworldly thing. I spoke the request quietly, almost a whisper. Take Oad out of the game. There. Every other request had been fulfilled no matter how crazy so this one should be no different. I would remove Oad from the game completely and without him there to thwart my progressions I could play forever. Nicholas and I could play forever. Forever. Just the two of us, with me guiding him and deciding his fate. It may not seem like something a good friend would do, but I wasn't Nicholas' friend anymore. I was his god. The screen faded to black once again. No text, no nothing. What's the matter? I asked. Not gonna leave, Pansy? I asked for it, now you have to do it. Fair is fair. The screen immediately changed to static. It was sudden, disconcerting break with my virtual reality that left me feeling like I'd been slapped across the face. Scratching. A sound of scratching, that's all I heard, scratching on glass. I approached the television, pressed my ear to the screen and listened. Scratching, slow and sparse at first, then more and more fervent. It sounded like rats were just behind the screen, clamoring and clawing to get out. The screen shifted a bit. Just the screen, and the bulky television set remained perfectly still. I stepped back as, not unlike a car window, the screen slowly descended and revealed the vast expanse of nothingness just behind. All the white, all the while the violent mosaic of static played on the gradually descending glass. I knew what I had done wrong. I asked for Oad to leave the game, and my request had been fulfilled. Appearing from the void like some horrific moon emerging from an eclipse, the pointed, twisted skull face of Oad peered out of the television at me. Its empty eye sockets at, at once, seeming both vengeful and sad. I'd never noticed the duality in the past, and perhaps only saw it now that I had lost most semblance of my own emotion. With the sound of an off-kilter roller coaster click clacking along some non-existent track, Oad rocketed fo forward from the television, his innumerable sets of ribs snaking out behind the malignant headbone. I fell to the floor in complete shock, unable to gain control of my motor skills or my voice as Oad sped through midair, over my living corpse, and shattered the front window. As he burst forth into the open night sky, never again to darken my sight, I could only stare upwards at the series of ribs blur blurring past. Within each cage, a person. Only a face, only hands. Faces crying. Hands grasping the white bars of the grim cells. White, black, Asian. Every race I knew or would come to know since. Every age from the smallest child to acne-ridden teenagers. In every rib cage, a stolen child. To this day, I recount the tale with neither a feeling of dread, nor fear, nor shame. I do not feel sad for them, I do not feel bad for myself, and I do not feel sorry for burdening you, burdening you with this knowledge. I don't feel anything anymore. I'm not even angry. I don't even remember what angry feels like. 
Maybe I could feel something, anything. I'd be able to figure out why one image still haunts me to this day. The mental picture of Nicholas's face, enclosed within ribs, peering out at me with dread, as if I was the monster. Purgatory and they beat the fucking case. Ha. I look around, man. 